And you mentioned that you found um, a lovely co-host now by the name of Melody, who's had this story that should survive quotes. And I know that the both of you come together are speaking about something that I believe needs a lot, a lot of attention. So Melody, when it comes to you surviving quotes, surviving this type of lifestyle, bring us up to speed, like identify what a cult is and how did you initially get involved in it? Okay. A cult is a group that, and, and, and a cult is not necessarily religious. That's, we, we like to emphasize that a cult can be religious, but it isn't always religious. It can be spiritual. It can be a self-help group, a meditation group. It could be political, all different kinds of cults that, that people can get involved in. Um, but a cult usually, not always, but usually has a charismatic, charismatic leader, and it usually is um, ultimately controlling and isolating of its members, meaning that they try to control um, the information that they get. They try to control the people that they see and talk to. They try to control behavior. They try to control their emotions. All of those things are, and, and usually it starts out slow. So, cause like Andrew and I both always say, nobody wakes up in one morning and says, I think I'm going to join a cult today. It's, you never are joining a cult. You're joining a religious organization or a self-help group or, you know, something like that. Something that seems innocent on the outside. Seems so benign. you don't know you're in, going into a cult when you join it. And for me, and mine was religious based. And I went in when I was young with my family. I was 15 when I joined with my parents and my younger sister. And um, the name of the cult that I was in was called the House of Yahweh. It's based out of Abilene, Texas. Uh, the leader um, it, it was Israel Hawkins. He did die a couple of years ago. He was older. He's 87. But the cult is still running. They are still, it's, it's like most of the members doubled down. And because, you know, we you always have that hope when you come out of a cult that when the leader goes, that the whole organization will dissolve. But unfortunately, that doesn't usually happen because the brainwashing is so deep that people need more than just the leader to die. Because then, you know, now he's just kind of like a messiah to them, you know. So um, so I got involved at 15. I um, I was I'm, I was engaged to the leader's son by the time I was 16. I was married by the time I was 18, had a child by the time I was 19. Um, so at all, I mean, that's those, those all pretty young, went pretty fast. It seemed like an eternity at the time, but it went pretty fast. When I look back on my life, it went very fast. And, um, you know, there that, and, and one of the, here's an example of some of the, the control is that, um, I, I never saw a doctor or went to a hospital when I was pregnant with my son. And this was my first pregnancy. I only saw midwives and I had a home birth. And that that baby was nine pounds, four ounces, which most likely in a hospital, that would have been a C-section birth. Um, you know, I most well and I was 16 days overdue. So most likely they wouldn't have let me go that far overdue, first of all. And they probably would have induced labor before then. And if he had been that big and they would have done an ultrasound and said this baby's too big. So I wouldn't have been in labor for 48 hours. Um, so that was a. That was a scary situation for my whole family, traumatic for my whole family. My dad wasn't allowed to be in the room. He was outside the door and um, he kept, he could hear that I was in distress and he kept saying, just let me take her to the ho hospital. Let me drive her to the hospital. And they said, well, you're not her head. You can't make that decision. That decision has to be made by her husband. And he was in the next house sleeping. So my dad tried to wake him up like, hey, hey, she's in distress. I want, just let me drive her to the hospital. But by then I did end up I did end up having him and, you know, I, we ended up both being okay. I mean, when they took my face and told me we're going to call 911, if you don't get him out in the next push, I was like, okay, I'm just doing everything I got to do to get this baby out. But it was traumatic. And my sister who was two years younger than me witnessed it. And it was very traumatic for her. Um, so that was kind of a crazy part of my story, but um, I got out because the leader essentially, and this was right around the time my son was born, they started teaching multiple marriage. 
And the multiple marriage teaching essentially came from the fact that uh, my father-in-law, because I'm now married to his son, so he's now my father-in-law, who's and he's also the leader, what basically got caught cheating on his wife with the secretary and basically said, I'm not cheating. I, I would never sin. I have done nothing wrong. And she is just another another wife or a concubine. And I have done nothing wrong. I have nothing to apologize for. And that basically this is what everybody is going to be allowed to do now in the organization. And we all have to accept it. So in that aspect, I I got a little lucky in escaping because I I actually got excommunicated because I gave a lot of pushback on this multiple marriage teaching. And it was something that I struggled to accept. I believed that at the time that I needed to accept it. And so I was going back and forth with between, okay, this is my religion. This is my belief. I have to accept this. And then the other half of me saying, I don't think I can. I'm a pretty jealous person. I don't think I want to share my spouse. So it was like this, this balancing act I was trying to withhold. And at the time, of course, my mother-in-law wasn't she was devastated when she found this out. So between her and my husband and my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, we all ended up getting excommunicated together because we just, we were supporting my mother-in-law and we just weren't complying. And that looked really bad for him because we were his immediate family. And if he couldn't get his immediate family to accept this and comply with it, it was going to be really hard to get the rest of the congregation to accept and comply with it. So he just, it, basically we became a liability to him and he had to, he had to cut us off. 